Okay, so it's uh, a couple of minutes after four, so let me introduce our speaker. So it's a pleasure for uh, me to introduce uh, today's speaker, uh, Professor Meng Cheng. Uh, Meng got his uh, undergrad, I mean, his PhD at the University of Maryland at College Park. And then after a postdoc at the Microsoft Research Station Q, we were able to land him here at Yale, where he's been an assistant professor since uh, 2017. Ming's research interests are theoretical condensed matter physics, broadly speaking. He, uh, that includes, for example, topological phases of matter, strongly correlated systems. He describes his main focus of research is utilizing symmetry principles to understand highly entangled quantum matter. For his research, he's received several awards and recognitions, even since he's been here. I'll just mention a couple that he has awards he's received since joining our faculty. Um, one is the Faculty Early Career uh, Award. The Faculty Early Career Development Program is an NSF-wide activity that offers the NSF, uh, I'm sorry, that offers the National Science Foundation's most prestigious awards in support of early career faculty who have the potential to serve as academic role models in research and education and to lead advances in the mission of their department or organization. He won this award in 2019 on the interplay of symmetry and topology and condensed matter systems. He also was awarded an Alfred P. Sloan Research Fellowship. Uh, this is awarded yearly to researchers in recognition of distinguished performance and the unique potential to make substantial contributions to their field. So he, um, so, uh, so today he's going to give us more uh, information on this. He's going to give us a presentation on symmetry and anomaly and quantum phases of matter. So Ming. So thank you for the introduction. Uh, can everyone hear me? All right, and let me first share my screen. So, okay. Right, so uh, it's a great pleasure to give the physics club today. I'm very grateful for this opportunity to share some exciting progress uh, in understanding of quantum phases of matter. So the study of the phases of matter is traditionally a central topic uh, in condensed matter physics, uh, but <clears throat> excuse me, the progress in this front has also generated many fruitful connections to you know, other areas of physics, such as high energy theory and even mathematical physics. And I, I, I hope to uh, touch upon these aspects as well. Uh, so please feel free to interrupt me with questions or comments. I can't quite see uh, the Zoom screen or see chats with my setup. So please just speak up if you, any, if you have any questions. Okay, so let's uh, get started. Without any doubt, symmetry is an extremely powerful notion in modern physics. So if we know a system has a certain symmetry, then we know immediately uh, no, a few nice things without doing much work. For example, we know that eigenstates or states of a system can be organized according to the representations of the symmetry group. And we have super selection rules that tell us which physical processes are allowed, which ones are forbidden. And if the symmetry is continuous, then we have you know, Noether's theorem uh, to tell us that there are conservation laws. Okay. Now, when it comes to a many body system, we encounter a new phenomenon, which is quite common, that the symmetry can be spontaneously broken what that means is that the ground state of the system does not have all the symmetries of the microscopic interactions or the Hamiltonian. So there's a certain kind of ordering in the ground state which breaks you know, the symmetries of the underlying interactions. So a large part of condensed matter physics is about the study of you know, various symmetry breaking phenomena. Okay. And as we learned from Landau, spontaneous symmetry breaking also provides a, a general kind of uh, scheme to classify different phases of matter, to put them into different groups. And probably the one course way uh, to go about this is to you know, say which ones break symmetries, which ones do not. Okay. And the ones that actually spontaneously break symmetries are called ordered. And the ones that do not are 
uh, accordingly called disordered. Okay. So here disorder does not mean that there are impurities or defects, it just means lack of ordering. So one good thing about uh, the symmetry breaking is that you can easily find very nice pictures, which kind of visually tells you, you know, we visually capture what happens. And here are a few pictures. So I'm sure everyone recognizes uh, the magnet, uh, which spontaneously breaks the spin rotation symmetry. In the middle is a picture of liquid crystal and the symmetry that's being broken is a spatial rotation symmetry. And uh, we also, uh, on the right is a picture of uh, you know, superfluid or ball einstein condensation and the symmetry being broken is a conservation of a number of particles. Now, on the other hand, uh, when there's no symmetry breaking, in other words, if we look at a disordered state, uh, we call it disorder, almost conveying the feeling that you no know, such states are fairly boring or featureless. Okay, and at least it was believed so for a long time. So we don't have much to say about disordered phase. Okay, now uh, it turns out that these disordered phases in fact, have a lot of rich structures in them. And this is kind of the main thing I want to uh, discuss in this talk. Okay. So there's a, a quite ambitious pro research program going on to you know, classify and characterize such disordered phases. And I just want to show here a kind of a map of what we currently know about them. So this is a map of zero temperature quantum matter. Okay, as of today, you, know, you can change overnight, but that's what we know today. Okay, uh, I, no, I don't want to explain each item here, but for this talk, uh, for, at least for the first part of the talk, I will focus on a particular subclass called uh, SPD phases, which I'll define very shortly, like next slide. Okay. And then in the second part, I will discuss the you know, connections between what I'll de describe uh, in the first part of the talk and the other items on this map. Okay, through what's called a quantum anomaly. Okay. All right. So before I get more specific, I'd like to kind of make a somewhat philosophical remark about approach. Okay. Uh, so a quantum many body system is very complicated. You have lots of particles with very complex interactions and you can ask a ton of questions. Okay. You can go into all kinds of details uh, about the system. And the amount of information that you can kind of extract is quite overwhelming. There's just too much information and can easily get lost. So to make progress, I will focus on what's called the universal properties, which are properties that shared by a whole class of similar quantum states and typically emerge at large scales, you know, at long uh, spatial scales and slow time scales. And because these are properties shared by a whole class of similar quantum states, these properties are supposed to be robust uh, against say small perturbations to the system. Okay. So I find this is a nice analogy with a painting, I guess it's really a lithograph by uh, Picasso, where he started, with a, started from a ball. Okay. Uh, hope everyone can see my mouse uh, with all the details, no, with four details. And then he deconstructed the ball until there are just a few lines left, but you can still recognize that it's essentially a ball. So that's a kind of level of understanding that we want to achieve about the quantum many body phenomena. Okay, uh, let me actually get a better, excuse me for one minute. Okay, so I think, uh, all right. So now let me define what uh, is uh, symmetry protective topological phase. Okay, this is a particularly simple class of you know, phases, disorder phases. Okay, and to define this class of phases, well, and here's our few characters of this class. So first of all, we will require that there is a gap to all excitations. So all excitations are separated from the ground state by some energy gap. And somewhat technical condition that you should have just a unique, a single ground state um, when there's no boundary. So these conditions guarantee that there's no symmetry breaking okay, of any kind. Uh, therefore, it's kind of guaranteed to be disordered or symmetric. And these conditions also simplify the problem 
uh, somewhat so that we can actually uh, make some progress. Okay. So for experts, the second condition also excludes uh, more exotic situations, say when they are anions. All right, so before talking about what is interesting, uh, I need to sort of define what is not interesting. Okay. And the kind of signature boring situation is the following. Okay. It's a kind of an atomic insulator. So what is this? Uh, what this depicts is a, a piece of solid and you have you know, on a, one item on each side and electrons fill up orbitals of this atom, uh, atomic orbitals up to a certain level. So you really have failed shells for each atom. Now, at least one electronic degree of freedom is concerned. Uh, this is uh, a complete boring and we can all agree that there's nothing interesting going on for this particular simple looking state. Okay. And this is what, what I will call a trivial, trivial state. This is completely boring, nothing interesting to talk about. And the question is, you know, given another, some other... Good. There, this is the theory. Oops. Okay, all right, I'll continue. So uh, the question is, if given another disorder state, does it look like this boring state? Does it kind of you know, belong to the same class as this boring one? When we say that one state looks like another, uh, the more precise statement is whether one can kind of smoothly deform a state to another one. Okay, no, here by deforming, I mean, you no, know, we can tune some parameters in the Hamiltonian as long as uh, no dramatic change to the state. Therefore, it means that we only really care about properties that do not change under such smooth deformations. And that is why you know, we only care about universal properties. Okay. And that's also a reason that the word topological appears here because you know, the topology is uh, uh, the mathematical subject that studies the properties of manifolds that are invariant under smooth deformations. So we're kind of doing topology, but for many body states. Okay, so this is, uh, the, the, the famous topologist's uh, mark, which is equivalent to a uh, donut, you know, if only topology is concerned. Okay, uh, as we will see shortly, given a system with a particular symmetry, there might be multiple distinct uh, SPT phases. Okay, so they do not break any symmetries, but nevertheless, they are still distinct from each other at a fundamental level. So you know, here I show a kind of schematic phase diagram where you have say symmetry breaking phase here and you have a few different SPT phases uh, over here. And in one part of the phase diagram, you can continuously go from one point to another you know, without encountering any uh, phase transitions. However, if you want to cross a boundary to go from one part to a different part, then you need to actually uh, cross a phase transition. Okay, provided that we do not break the symmetry. So in other words, the distinction between these different phases is really protected by the symmetry. If we do not have that symmetry, then there's no fundamental distinction between these two, these different phases. So we have a symmetry protected distinction and that is why they are called symmetry protected phases. Okay. So this is here the, another kind of schematic uh, picture of you no. Know, what happens if you try to go from one phase to another, you have to cross a transition, a dramatic transition if you know, the symmetry is preserved, but you can go around it uh, and without encountering any transition if you are allowed to break the symmetry. Okay. Now, even before this concept was formally introduced, uh, there were already quite a few examples discovered uh, early on. So the first one was discovered by uh, Duncan Haldane back in the 80s, although its nature, its SPT nature was recognized a bit later. Okay. And the system is uh, a chain of, a one dimensional chain of magnets and each magnetic moment here is modeled as just a spin one with antiparagnetic interaction. Okay. So that means you know, spins can lower energy by anti-lying with each other. Okay, so this is kind of a, a, no, a simple spin one anti-pragmatic chain. Okay. And the ground state is such that if you cut this chain open, you find 
on the edge, on the end of the chain, an effective spin one half degree of freedom, even though the chain is made out of spin one. Okay. All right, so that's one example. That's a very famous example. And the other family of examples are non-interacting fermion topological, topological phases, you know, things that you can find in band insulators or like superconductors. Okay. And the important uh, you know, achievement was the complete enumeration or classification of such non-interacting fermion topological phases roughly 10 years ago or 11 years ago. And from then on, many new examples have been discovered, you know, going beyond these free fermion phases. And what I'm going to describe now is kind of a, a general physical picture, okay, uh, emerging out of works of many people that you know, is believed to apply to both the non interacting and interacting systems you know, about you know, what these the SPT phases look like. So that is what I'm going to do now. Okay, so uh, to explain this picture, let's consider a very simple system called an icing magnet. Okay, so it's kind of a uni, uni axial magnet where the magnetic moments have two possible orientations. You can either point up or down. Okay, and the symmetry is such that the two orientations are sort of equivalent. So you can flip all the spins and the microscopic interactions should stay the same. And this is called icing symmetry, just because icing studied this kind of system uh, first. Okay. And we can represent operators on these spins using polymetrices. You know, the sigma z, the value of sigma z tells you whether the spin's pointing up or down, and sigma x just flips the spin. Okay. So the icing symmetry is a product of spins, of product of sigma x acting on each of the spins. And in such a system, it's very easy to you know, visualize what the spontaneous symmetry breaking uh, state looks like. Okay. So let's just imagine that spins interact with each other ferromagnetically, meaning that the two neighboring spins can lower energy by aligning with each other. Then you can uh, minimize the energy just by polarizing all the spins in the same direction. That way you can maximize, you know, maximize the gain from the ferromagnetic interaction. But then there are two possibilities. You, know, you can either have the spins all pointing up uh, or spin all pointing down. Okay? And these two states have exactly the same energy because they are exactly related by the icing uh, spin flipping transformation. Okay? So this is a very kind of prototypical example of a uh, ferromagnetic order breaking the icing symmetry spontaneously in the ground state, okay? even though the interaction itself preserves the symmetry. Now, uh, on the other side of uh, the story, there is a paramagnetic phase. No, there's no magnetization, it's disordered. And in that case, we certainly know that spins should not be polarized, okay? So they can fluctuate. And it turns out that, <clears throat> excuse me, a nice way to think about the paramagnetic side of icing magnet is to kind of start from the ferromagnetic ground state and think about how to destroy this ferromagnetic order. Okay. And that is also, you know, that, that also echoes with what really happens in a, a, you know, practically in a piece of magnet, you almost never have the case that all the spins actually point in the same direction. Due to inhomogeneities in the sample, they naturally form domains inside which the spins point in the same direction, but if you no, look at different domains, uh, the magnetizations are different. Okay. So this is, this is a kind of defective ferromagnet, not the perfect one that I showed on the previous slide. And the boundaries between different domains uh, with a uniform magnetization are called domain walls. Okay. And this, you know, it looks like this for this simple icing uh, magnet. The blue lines are the domain walls. Now we can imagine that there are lots of these domain walls. And in fact, these domain walls can be dynamical. You know, they can undergo some kind of quantum fluctuations. And it, it is as if we are kind of you know, melting the ferromagnetic order by making more cracks in the form of the domains. And eventually, uh, in fact, you have to go across a transition, the domain walls just proliferate. You have domain walls everywhere. 
and that becomes a, and it becomes a pair magnet. Okay. So formally, we can write down a quantum wave function where we kind of superpose all the states with you know, every possible configuration of domains. You know, that's a kind of proliferation of domain walls. And this is sort of the perfectly uh, disordered state. Okay. A, super, a equal weight superposition of all possible domain wall configurations. But, but that's uh, not an eigenstate though, right? That is an eigenstate, not eigenstate of the ferromagnetic uh, Hamiltonian, of course. Okay. Uh, I'm imagining that you know, we are tuning in some other, say, transverse fields to make this happen. Yeah, but I'm only talking about a level of wave functions right now. Right, and you're saying that there is a Hamiltonian for which this wave function will be an eigenstate. Yeah, of course. Uh, yes, because uh, exactly <laughs> because this state, I deliberately made it you know look more complicated, but really just. Uh, there's a, just a, a much simpler way to describe the same state where each spin is really polarized along x, right? Because uh, quantum mechanically, the spin polarized along x is an equal weight superposition of spin polarizing, polarized up and down. Right. So if you expand this simple looking weight function, the basis of up and down spins, you get this complicated looking weight function. And of course, you know, the, this, this wave function is a ground state of uh, Hamiltonian with only uh, transverse field along the x direction. So this is kind of magnetic version of our boring insulator. In this case, all spins are polarized along x direction. Okay? And then there's no symmetry breaking of any kind, at least for the icing symmetry. OK, so now we can start you know, uh, making some changes. Okay, and I want to make a little tweak in this paramagnetic wave function. And let's talk about wave function first. Instead of summing over all the possible domain wall configurations with equal weight, let's you know, put in some uh, minus signs, okay, to make it more interesting. And the minus signs are not random. They are given according to number of domain walls you have in this particular configuration. For example, for this state, there's one domain wall uh, it's one domain of spin down surrounded by spin up, so you put a minus sign. And if you have two domain walls, we put a plus sign. Okay, so the sign is just the number of domain walls, the parity of number of domain walls. So once you throw in all these signs, okay, it's still a paramagnetic wave function because we still have superpositions of all different spin configurations, so there's no order of any kind, and the nature of state somehow is fundamentally changed. I cannot really prove this uh, no, in real time, but one can show that you can never make this state look like uh, the magnetic version of the boring insulator. Okay, it's, you, you can never make it look like a simple state of this kind uh, without breaking the icing symmetry. Okay. So this modification of the wave function, whether you call it simple or not, uh, that's, no, that's subjective, but this simple modified wave function is an example of a non-trivial SPT state. Uh, protected by the icing symmetry. Okay. Now, with a wave function, you may object that I'm just you know, pulling out of a wave function uh, out of thin air, right? Is it physically legitimate? Okay. Uh, does it make sense as some state in the phase diagram, you know, broadly speaking, of an icing magnet? Well, we know the answer is, the answer is yes. And the reason is that we can actually find the Hamiltonian which is quite complicated, so I don't want to bother you with the actual form, but it's completely physical. It contains interactions, you no know, local interactions between spin, although you no know, more than two spins. So, and and who's and the ground state of that complicated Hamiltonian, uh, also complicated but physical Hamiltonian, is this wave function. Okay. So it is a state that exists somewhere in the phase diagram of an icing magnet. Uh, guaranteed by the existence of uh, the parent Hamiltonian. Okay, so this picture of describing a quantum disorder state in terms of you know, fluctuating domain walls turns out to be extremely um, useful and opens up ways to understand many other, and essentially, uh, at least that's a conjecture that all the other SPT faces in terms of you know, decorations on domain wall. 
So what do I mean by that? Well, so think about, think of domain walls now as really like the dynamical degrees of freedom in your system. These are like one dimensional uh, objects in a two dimensional magnet, okay? And now you can imagine we uh, make these domain walls themselves carry some one dimensional state, okay? So for instance, for instance, we can imagine some one dimensional state are attached to domain walls so that these states kind of fluctuate together with the domain walls. And these 1D states themselves may, them, may be non-trivial, like the Haldane chain or the spin one chain, then we get a different SPT state. Okay. So this is a kind of recipe to generate more SPT states once you have, say, some lower dimensional ones. You just start decorating domain walls and writing down wave function at least. Now, uh, this is another example. It's a different kind of decoration is that imagine you have these icing magnets, but now the symmetry is a time reversal symmetry. You know, uh, so the difference between the icing time reversal here is not particularly important, uh, at least for the, the kind of pictures I want to draw. And instead of you know, decorating the domain walls, now what I do is that when I pump a domain wall into my wave function, I also decorate the domain wall with some electrons and holes. So whenever a domain wall is comes out of the wave function, it also has these two uh, electrons. Well, one electron, one hole somewhere on the domain wall. Okay. Of course, there's a precise rule of you know, how to putting these electrons and holes on the domain wall. But once you do that and you form this superposition, it turns out quite you know, uh, remarkably that this is actually the same state as a two dimensional topological insulator. Okay. Um, and this, uh, no, although this is, might not be the most uh, simple way to describe a two dimensional topology insulator, it means that you can also incorporate these more familiar kinds of uh, topological states in this framework, in this way of, you no, know, in this physical picture. Okay. okay, so I want to include one slide about you know, what the general theory looks like. So you can now imagine decorating the domain walls at various different dimensions. So you can decorate domain walls themselves, which are one dimension objects in a 2 dB system. Or you can look at junctions of domain walls. And in this case, in the 2D case, they're just points and you can put some fermions or you know, maybe other stuff like charges on the junctions. Okay. And you can imagine doing this in higher dimensions as well. You get a hierarchy of different you know, decorations. And if you work out all these decorations carefully, you find that they form a very nice mathematical structure uh, called, you know, for experts, it's called a Tia Hisbrush spectral sequence. It's just a way to organize the domain wall decorations. And we believe that this is, uh, this is all you are going to get. This covers all the different SPT phases okay, uh, with you know, some caveats, like what happens in the continuous symmetry. Uh, case, but essentially it covers all SPT phases. Okay? It provides a picture of what the wave function look like for the, these, these non-trivial phases. And by these constructions, you know, we also find new electronic phases, topological phases without any uh, band analog. You cannot realize these uh, electronic topological insulators in non-interacting bands. So you know, this is a kind of a, both a nice way and a powerful uh, method to, to, to classify and organize uh, all of these quantum disorder states. Okay. All right, so uh, I have talked about ground state wave functions so far. Okay. And I think it's a good point to pause a minute and see whether there are any questions. Okay, so I assume uh, everything's fine. So, so far I've focused on the quantum wave functions. Okay? And you might worry that wave function is not really something that you can actually measure, you can directly observe. Okay? You're not going to measure these funny signs in the wave function directly in experiments. So you know, are there any observable effects due to these funny phase vectors or like the decorations on domain walls? So the answers to this question turns out to be actually very interesting. And there are essentially two ways you can go to observe these uh, subtle quantum effects. Okay. 
And one is to look at how the system responds to external gauge field. And this sentence may sound uh, somewhat unfamiliar, but this is really what's being done routinely in the lab. Anytime you turn on uh, the voltage or turn on electric magnetic field on in your system, that's coupling to external electromagnetic gauge field to probe the system. Okay. And of course, now you know, to probe other SPT phases, you need to think about gauge fields of other symmetries. But you no, know, that's at least mathematically that is fine. An example of this kind of response is a quantum hall conductance. But I, I want to discuss the other approach. Okay. And the idea is that let's look at a boundary between a SPT phase, a non-trivial one, and a trivial one, or a vacuum, if you like. And since SPT phase is fundamentally different from the trivial one, then intuitively it shouldn't be possible to kind of smoothly interpolate the, between the two states uh, on the on spatial. Right. Then something must happen on interface. Okay. So what happens? Well, the short answer is that there are degrees of freedom living on the interface. And the way that these degrees of freedom transform under symmetries weird is anomalous. Okay. That's a word that we choose uh, to describe you know, this, this particular property. Okay. So in short, there are anomalous symmetries on the boundary. Okay. And I'm, I'm going to uh, unpack a little bit what this means. So this is going to be the you know, kind of point of view that we will temporarily forget about the bulk and just study the boundary as a quantum system on its own, okay, one dimensional lower than the bulk. Okay. So we're going to look at a quantum many body system which secretly, secretly lives on the boundary of some higher dimensional bulk uh, with anomalous or weird symmetries. So again, let me first uh, give you an example that is probably familiar to, uh, to many of you. Okay. And that is uh, the quantum Hall insulator. Okay. So I will keep things general and let's just imagine there's an insulating material, an insulator, but has non-zero quantum Hall conductance. Okay. That includes a familiar quantum Hall effect in two dimensional electron gas, but also other systems such as quantum anomalous Hall insulator. And it's really important here that the bulk is an insulator and we are thinking about, you know, T equals zero or very low temperature compared to the bulk gap. So there are essentially no states for charges to go below the charge gap. So by definition, a non-zero Hall conductance means that if you turn on the electric field, say along the X direction, then currents flow in the Y direction. Okay. Now imagine a system actually has an edge along the X direction parallel to the direction of the electric field. So suppose that you are a physicist living on this edge, well, you find something very strange. If you turn on the electric field, okay, which normally just you know, drive the charges moving along the edge, if you are living on the edge, but somehow uh, in this system, the charges just disappear, mysteriously disappear from the edge, you know, from the point of view of an edge physicist. Okay. So, if you just want to describe what happens on the edge from the point of view of this physicist living on the edge, because the bulk is insulating, okay, it, there are no states, in principle, there are no states for the charges to go, it appears that charge is simply not conserved on the edge, but only when the electric field is turned on. Otherwise, the charge, charge is conserved. So the fact that charges flow from the edge to the bulk uh, appears as, a kind of an anomalous situation on the edge that the conservation of charge is broken whenever you turn on electric field. Okay. And that is a kind of an example of anomaly uh, on this edge of a quantum Hall insulator. So this is, uh, a, you know, this is a good example because you know, we are familiar with flowing of uh, currents and uh, Hall effect. Uh, what about uh, this, this Z, this icing paramagnet, the one that with these funny sign factors. Well, in that case, the edge of you know, this two dimensional icing paramagnet uh, can be actually modeled as a one dimensional icing system, a one dimensional icing paramagnet or icing magnet. Okay. And normally, normally, if you look at an ordinary one dimensional icing magnet, well, the icing symmetry simply flips all the spins 
And this kind of ordinary non-anonymous asymmetry has an on-site nature, meaning that you can figure out what the transformation does to the manual system by basically telling how it acts on each individual spin. Okay. So I think spin flips all spins at I think symmetry flips all spins at once and just by flipping them then one by one. Okay. However, that is not the case uh, for this icing one-dimensional icing magnet that lives on boundary of the two-dimensional uh, topological pair magnet. So we can think of it as an icing symmetry with a little tweak again. So in addition to flipping all the spins, the transformation also attaches a sign vector to the wave function. So for example, this string of spins are flipped, but then it gets also additional phase vector, the sign vector that essentially counts the number of domain walls you're going to find in this uh, configuration of icing spins. Okay, the number of domain wall divided by two. <clears throat> and you can probably tell that this unusual sign factor comes from the structure, the sign structure that enters the wave function in two dimensions. Okay. So though this, this sign factor makes the transformation a little bit non-local, okay, because if you want to tell where are the domain walls, domain walls are by definition, this 1D system, you know, the locations where the neighboring spins uh, point to opposite directions, you have to kind of check uh, you know, what orientate, what spins, how spins orient on neighboring sites. Okay. Uh, so this little bit of non-local character is kind of intrinsic to this transformation. There's no way to get rid of it, say by, say by changing basis. So it's a really intrinsic character of this particular transformation. And that is a common feature, <clears throat> a defining feature of all the anomalous symmetry that it cannot be made completely on site. There's always a little bit of non-local uh, character to this symmetry. Okay. But if you include the bulk, then you know, there's nothing weird about this transformation. You know, in the bulk, the symmetry is completely on site. You just flip all the spins. You don't really do anything else. Okay. And the sign factor actually comes from the same kind of sign factor in the ground state wave function. Okay. So the way that this, this kind of anomaly is fixed by the bulk is because the domain wall, which might appear as a point in this one dimensional magnet is actually not a point, actually goes into the bulk. Uh, if you really recognize that there's actually a two dimensional bulk, okay, where this 1D magnet is attached on. So once we overlooked that uh, the bulk part of the domain wall and we conclude that this transformation is strange, but if you include that, then nothing is strange. Okay. And the sign factor merely comes from the kind of the bulk wave function. Okay, okay. all right. So hope, I hope this gives you at least some flavor of what an anomalous transformation means, anomalous symmetry means, okay. And uh, you know, what, why is it something useful to think about? Well, uh, from, the, from what I described, you can probably kind of get a feeling that this anomaly is really a property of, uh, of the Hilbert space, of you know, kind of the, the underlying system. It's not particularly tied to a certain state or certain wave function on the boundary, at least. Okay. So whatever happens, on the boundary for these boundary degrees of freedom um, at low energy, for example, if you care about low energy physics, no, there's maybe an array of phenomena at low energy that might be described by some low energy theory. That low energy theory must be able to tell that the system is, you know, has all these anomalies, right? The system is really living on the boundary of a high dimensional bulk. <clears throat> Excuse me. And this idea was you know, first uh, formulated by toothed uh, back in 1980 as a statement that anomalies in quantum field theory, anomalies are invariant under RG flow, okay? And in particular, what that means that having some anomaly implies that the theory at low energy cannot be completely empty, okay? You have to have something going on at low energy in order to incorporate this anomaly. And in particular, what the empty means an uh, empty situation means is that you have a fully gap state on the boundary. Again, this is about the boundary state, a fully gap state, but without any degeneracy. Okay. 
and that is uh, the kind of emptiness uh, and the empty in quote, uh, and which is ruled out by the presence of the nominee. Okay, so it kind of provides a no-go theorem. It tells you that it cannot be completely boring. It has to have something going on at low energy. And what's more, it actually provides a more a way to kind of you know again classify different low energy behavior into groups, and each group corresponds to a certain class of anomaly. Okay. So you maybe you can uh, you know, look, at a, look at what happens in these three series and they all turn out to have the same anomaly and we've put them into this class and then the other series, candidate series have a different kind of anomaly. And then if we know that this system has this particular anomaly, you no, know, just because we know what the bulk is, then we could conclude that it has to be one of these three theories, not the other two. So this way, this is a way to kind of constrain the dynamics of the system you know, without actually solving, uh, solving the problem. Uh, these put some you know, uh, powerful constraints on you know, what kind of low energy behaviors you should expect from this theory. It's not unique, right? it doesn't entirely solve the problem, but it's some useful information. Okay. All right, to, to really make this work, while well, we need two pieces of information. Uh, one is that, well, we need to be able to you know, know what are the classes of anomalies there are, okay? And I cannot, again, I cannot prove this, I have to take my words, but these are, again, classified exactly by uh, the same classification of the SPD phases in higher dimension, in one dimension higher. And that's just because anomalous symmetries are what happens on the boundary of uh, SPT phases. And you know, to kind of complete a circle, you also need to uh, be able to kind of compute or figure out what anomalies uh, are present in the given low energy theory, okay? Um, you no, know, given some low energy behavior, low energy phenomena, you know, how do you tell which class it, uh, it falls in? Okay. And once you have these two, then you can kind of make use of this uh, correspondence and constrain the behavior of uh, a system with anomalous symmetries. All right, so now I want to take these ideas and apply them to uh, a condensed matter sort of uh, system. Okay, and uh, let me see whether, just pause a minute to see whether there are any questions. Okay, so I want to you know, discuss applications of these ideas to you know, essentially to magnets, okay, to systems of spins. And uh, the kind of question is, uh, you know, is a, to central to this, to this kind of system is, you know, what is the ground state of say a bunch of uh, a lattice of interacting spins? Okay, and here uh, what I show is a, a Heisenberg interaction, that the simplest kind of interaction can write down for quantum spins, SI dot SJ, and you have maybe other terms. So what is the ground state of this Hamiltonian? Well, it turns out that this is actually a very difficult question because the spins, you know, they are is really an interacting problem. Okay? In general, it's an interacting problem, and you no, know, we don't really have that many uh, methods to deal with uh, a generic interacting problem like this. But we know, you know what are the options, right? So we we know that you know, this this magnet can spontaneously break the symmetry, form, for example, the anti ferromagnetic near order or valence bound solid order, which uh, does not break the spin rotation symmetry, but breaks the translation symmetry of the lattice. Uh, you can also have disorder state, but now it's not necessarily the SPT kind of disorder states, but more broadly just quantum disorder states, which do not break any of the symmetries of the problem. And these are called quantum spin liquids. Okay. Uh, here, this is a kind of a candidate uh, for the quantum spin liquids, which called Kerber semicide, a mineral discovered in, in Chile, I think. Um, and these states are extremely kind of rare to come by because usually you, know, you expect that if, if you have a system spins, they order at low temperature. And quantum spin liquid is exactly the opposite that you know, it doesn't order even down to zero temperature. Okay, so you know, how is this problem connected to no, these SPT phases or uh, the anomalies. 
Well, uh, so to before I discuss that, let's let me uh, tell you about a, a famous classic result in quantum mag magnetism, and this was proved by Lieb, Schultz, and Schultz and Mattis uh, back in the sixties. Okay, and the statement of this Lieb Schultz Mattis theorem, it's really a, a almost a rigorous theorem. Uh, no, not we don't we, we don't really have many rigorous theorems like this in uh, quantum antibody physics. And the theorem states that if you have a spin one half chain, if you have a one dimension you know, chain of spins, uh, such that interruptions preserve the spin rotation symmetry and it's also translation invariant, okay, then it cannot have non-degenerate ground state. So that means the ground state is either degenerate, you have some kind of degeneracy in the ground state, or it scapeless, okay, and that is, exactly what happens in you know, materials which can be thought of as one dimensional spin chains. So you might have gapless spins, gapless spin nouns, you know, degrees of freedom that carry spins, which can be probed, uh, for example, in this case, by some kind of neutron scattering. Or if you want to have a gap, then the only way to go is to spontaneously dimerize these spins, forming a kind of valence bond between neighboring spins in this case. So these are the two options, and that exactly fits what, you know, what is allowed by the lipschultz matic theorem. So later on, the theorem was extended to higher dimensions by uh, Oshikawa and Hastings. Okay. And the statement is very similar. So now if you have, say, a magnet, a spin one half magnet in higher dimensions, in two dimensions or three dimensions, and spin one half magnet means that there's, say, single spin one half per unit cell or you could have a spin three half per unit cell. Okay. If you have all number of spin one half per unit cell and uh, the interruptions preserve the spin rotation symmetry and the translation symmetry, then the theorem guarantees again that there's, it's impossible to have a non-degenerate ground state in this system. Okay. And then it allows a variety of possibilities, okay, but rules out the most boring, the most uninteresting uh, case. So it means that something must happen, something kind of no, interesting must happen at low energy. So now the options in high dimensions are uh, a little more, and there are more options at high dimensions. So you can still have all these symmetry breaking states, new order VBS, uh, but now the spin liquids can come in more varieties. So uh, if you still recall what I discussed about the uh, general constraints of anomaly on you know, the low energy dynamics or quantum system, well, this sounds a lot like some kind of anomaly constraints, right? It rules out a complete boring situation um, that you cannot have uh, a non-degenerate ground state, a gapped ground state, okay? So indeed, it turns out that this is some kind of anomaly constraint, even though we are talking about a piece of magnet, you know, say a two-dimensional lattice of magnet, it doesn't seem like there's, it's a boundary of some higher dimensional system, right? It's just a two-dimensional magnet. But somehow it obeys a constraint that really resembles uh, the constraint that follows from quantum anomaly. Okay. So just to make that very explicit, well, it's useful to think of a spin one half, right, which I uh, discussed very early on in the beginning of the talk, a spin one half as an edge of a one dimensional spin chain in the SPT phase, okay? So this one dimensional spin chain is uh, no, the one that's, that was discovered by Haldane, say a spin one, spin one Heisenberg chain with a spin one half degree of freedom on the edge. Okay. And now imagine we form an array of such spin chains, okay? And we cut a surface perpendicular to, to these spin chains. So at the surface, we find this dangling spin one half from each of these chains. So suppose that these chains are arranged in a square lattice. Then on the surface here, you find an array of spin one halves. So even though you don't have to, uh, it, it's actually, it turns out to be very useful to think of an actual piece of spin one half magnet, in this case, a, a sheet of spin one half magnet, is really a surface of a three dimensional state. Okay. And this three-dimensional state is a symmetry-protected topological state, 
But now the protection comes from not only the spin rotation symmetry, but also uh, the spatial symmetry, the translation symmetries. Okay. So I haven't discussed uh, no, what, what happens if you include space time symmetries into you know, the story of SPT phase, but you can imagine that you know, one can generalize uh, the story to include space time symmetries. In this case, this is an example of an SPT, three dimension SPT state protected by you know, these three symmetries, the spin rotation, the translation along the two directions perpendicular to the chain. All right. You assume um, some weak couplings between the chains in the box yes. or? Yes, so uh, in the ideal limit, these chains are not coupled at all, but you know, we can allow some weak couplings as long as that weak coupling preserve these symmetries. Okay. Right. Okay. So this is, of course, again, uh, so you don't have to, right? This spin one half magnet is not a boundary of anything. It just exists on its own. Um, but it's, this is a very kind of useful uh, a theoretical gadget, if you like, to, to view this spin one half magnet. And once we have this point of view, Okay, we know that this spin one half magnet is really a boundary of a three dimensional SPT state. Then you can apply all this knowledge about you know, anomalies, quantum anomalies on the boundary of SPT to the spin one half magnet. Okay. And again, whatever happens in the spin one half chain at low energy, okay, maybe you describe it in terms of using some quantum field theory, it has to match this quantum anomaly. Okay. So uh, let's, let me just go over a few examples of, um, of, of this kind of you know, matching uh, what happens at low energy of this spin magnet, spin one half magnet, with you know, what one expects from the point of view of quantum anomaly. Okay? Although this time, you know, we, we have to involve uh, spatial translation symmetries. <clears throat> okay, so the simplest example is again this one dimensional spin chain. And this is, of course, very well understood. No, it was solved. Uh, let's say we take uh, a spin one half Heisenberg chain, and it was solved by Beta back in 1930s. Uh, no, exactly. Okay. And we know that this, at low energy, this Heisenberg chain is described by a conformal field theory. It's a critical theory uh, called SU2 level one. Okay. And uh, I, no. These details do not really matter that much, but the thing that I want to uh, to bring up is that this low energy state can be thought of as a fluctuating order parameter. No, there's no really no order in uh, the spin chain, but there's a fluctuating order parameter that is made out of the near order, which is a vector, and the VBS order, which is a, a scalar, a real number. Okay, and together you get a, a four component vector. And the low energy theory can be thought of as a fluctuating you know, O4 order parameter, a four component vector, but with a, a technically called a level one Wesson Mino Witten term. Okay. And uh, no, the important thing that low energy states have an enhanced symmetry. Okay. Although the microscopic spin chain has only spin rotation symmetry and translation symmetry, but the low energy physics has a symmetry enhanced to. Uh, SO4 or O4, okay, no, rotating these four vectors. And O4 no, is really the same as two copies of SU2, so you can label the low energy states in terms of two SU2 spins. Okay. So here I show a spectrum of this one dimensional spin chain. Okay. So you see that there are, these are gapless, these are conformal field series, so the spectrum touches a zero ground state here. And this state, this point here is uh, 0, 0, okay, in terms of these two SU2 spins. Okay. So these are kind of singlets in both SU2. And if we move uh, across to this point where you have momentum pi, so this is a spectrum as a function of many body momentum. And at momentum pi, you have this 1 half, comma 1 half. And if you are familiar with the representation theory of SO4, this is really just a vector representation, which is this guy. And SO3 symmetry is implemented by just rotating this new order parameter and the translation put a minus sign in front of the vector N just because this guy sits at momentum pi. 
Okay, so um, so what is this anomaly here? What is the anomaly that I advertised earlier? Okay, so lipschitz matthew theorem says, well, if you increase the length of this chain by one, you have to insert a spin one half, okay, to increase the length of the chain by one. But it seems difficult for the low energy theory to know the size of system, right? No, and the low energy field theory is not supposed to know how large a system is or like how many sides there are. But somehow, that's why the answer is no. The theory does not know how, what is the length of the system, okay, not intrinsically. But interestingly, it, know how to, it knows how to change the size. It knows how to increase the size by one. Okay. So how does that work? Well, so let's imagine we have uh, you know, the ground state, start from the ground state of the system, which is in the zero comma zero sector, okay, and with length L. So strictly speaking, you have to choose L to be an even integer. So it's in this uh, singular sector. And now we want to increase the length by one, okay? But now imagine that, no, you, all you know is this low energy field theory. You don't really know the microscopic uh, ingredients of the system, okay? But just by knowing how the translation acts on the low energy degrees of freedom, you know, it's actually possible to figure out how to increase the length by one by kind of twisted boundary condition of this chain uh, with a translation flux inserted. Okay, so there's a well-defined way to increase the size by one uh, by twisting some boundary condition in this chain. And once we know, you know this low energy theory, you know, all the symmetries, you can go and calculate what happens with this change of the boundary condition. And that exactly modifies the spin chain from the zero comma zero sector to the one half comma zero sector once you increase L plus to L plus one. Okay. And this is a spin one half, this is spin one half. So that's exactly what we expect. So we increase L by one, we have to add spin one half. Okay. And of course, for this particular case, no, we know, we already know that you have to have a spin one half once you increase size on one. So it's a kind of nice check but this argument can be taken, can be generalized to other you know, theories and you can kind of figure out which ones can actually be possibly realized in the spin one half chain just by you know, going through this argument. Okay. All right, so this is a one dimensional example. Now I want to kind of you know, quickly flash through uh, a couple more examples in higher dimensions. So in two dimensions, there's a new option for uh, what can happen to this spin one half magnet and what can happen the topological spin liquids. Uh, so unfortunately, we have just too many topological words of topological floating around, but this is a different kind of topological state compared to pretty much everything that I have talked, talked about so far. Okay. So the simplest option here is a Z2 spin liquid. Okay. So this Z2 here just means that the Lorentz theory is a Z2 gauge theory. And it's fully gapped with topological order. What that means is that the low energy excitations can be described in terms of uh, fractional, fractionalized particles, which are called anions. Okay? And there are four types of fractional excitations. Uh, though this is the non-fractional excitation. And you have an E particle, which carries spin one half. And you have an M particle, which does not carry any spin. And you have an emergent fermion. Remember that we are looking at a spin system. There are no fermions uh, to begin with, but somehow emergent, there emerges a kind of fermionic excitation at low energy, okay? and which also carries spin one half. So these particles have braiding statistics. They are anions. For example, this guy is a fermion, uh, even though we start from a spin system. And if you have an M particle, M anion sitting somewhere and you move an E particle around it, the wave function picks up a minus one. So that is a braiding statistics between the E and M particles. Okay. So you can roughly think of E as a kind of charge one of a charge one and M as a flux pi. So if you take charge one around flux pi, uh, you pick up the Aharonov bond phase of minus one. Okay, so, um, so a spin one half system can realize this, oh, well, this kind of topological spin liquid can be realized in the spin one half system. Now, you, again, you have the question of how this kind of anomaly matching works in this case. 
And the intuitive picture of you know, this LSM, Lipschitz Mattis anomaly matching, is a screening. Okay. So we start from a problem of spin one half per site. Okay. So these spin one halves, you have a two dimensional Hilbert space on each side, which is a spin one half degree of freedom. And now to get a fully gapped ground state, well, you kind of have to you know, neutralize, you have to kind of screen these spin one halves because these spin one halves are degenerate. Okay. You have to kind of lift this massive degenerate uh, manifold by kind of screening the spin one halves. And the, this topological spin liquid manages to do this by kind of having a background of E charges. Remember that E charges carry spin one half to neutralize the, the actual spin one halves on the lattice. So it's kind of a screening okay, to neutralize the spin one halves that we have on the lattice. Of course, it doesn't really mean that you have to put these charges uh, these E charges, E anions on the lattice. This is really just a, a picture of what happens in the ground state. Okay. So more precisely, the M anions, when it moves in this, on this lattice, it sees the background of pi fluxes because E particles appear as pi fluxes for the M anions. So they are moving in this pi flux lattice. Okay. Therefore, collectively, you know, this, this collection of phenomena like say the E anions carrying spin one half and M anions moving the pi flux lattice is known as a symmetry fractionalization. Okay. And uh, there's a very general theory of uh, you know, bulk surface correspondence, bulk boundary correspondence for a gapped topological phase in two dimensions. So, and this went back to you know, the, the work that we did back in uh, 2014, but the general zero anomaly was only worked out last year. And now we are able, we can compute, uh, if you give me a, a, a pattern of rationalization and gap to the logical phase in two dimensions, we can compute what anomalies uh, you can extract from this theory. Okay. And the formula looks like this. So no, it's some well-defined formula. Okay. No, I, I, I don't want to explain what exactly the symbols mean. Okay, so the last example that is uh, the three dimensions. And in that case, you again have a different kind of spin liquid available. It's called a U1 spin liquid, which is gapless now compared to the 2D case where we have gapped spin liquid. And at low energy, this spin liquid can be thought of as emergent light. So we have gapless photons, no, not the real light, but no, emergent excitations that are described by equations very similar to Maxwell's equations. Okay, so at little energy, you have these emergent gapless photons. And above a certain energy gap, you, you find uh, charges, no, electric charges, and emergent electric charges and magnetic charges, magnetic monopoles. Of course, not the real electromagnetism, but a kind of emergent electromagnetism in some material. Uh, okay, and again, uh, if you want this, if you want to find this in the system of spin one half, well, this low energy theory has to be able to saturate the anomaly, okay, the anomaly of Lipschitz Mattis, and again that places certain constraints on you no, know, what quantum numbers these electric charges and magnetic monopoles have to carry. Okay, you can actually pin it down to a particular type of uh, symmetry fractionalization pattern on these you know, charged excitations. All right, so uh, that is all I want to discuss. So just a quick summary. So you know, there are distinct symmetric quantum disorder gap spaces whose boundaries have anomalous symmetry transformations. Okay. So we have you know, made a lot of progress in theoretically classify and characterize these quantum phases. And I have you know, described a kind of physical picture of fluctuating domain walls. That, uh, that are believed to capture basically all these symmetry protected topological phase. And that gives an in kind of interesting uh, consequence of you know, quantum anomalies uh, on the boundary of the SSPT phases. And we can actually interpret this result of uh, quantum magnetism as a global anomaly, a quantum anomaly of uh, in such a spin system, okay, which places constraints on the low energy physics. So, uh, no, I want to end here and uh, thank you all for the attention.
And again, I want to acknowledge my group. Uh, Joe you know, is a graduate student here and uh, Ting Ray Wang, my postdoc, and Dominic Williamson who was a postdoc here and now moved to Stanford. And uh, Liu Jingzhou in parameter, Shang Tiangning is a student, well, the postdoc in Hong Kong University and my long-term collaborator, Mason Bakashi. Okay, so again, thanks for your attention. I think I'm staying on time. Yes, okay, great. Thank you, Ming. So thank you for this wonderful talk. Um, I don't see any hands raised, but we have time for maybe uh, one or two quick questions if, if, if uh, anyone wants to ask a question. So, yeah. So, yeah, I don't know how to raise my hand, so I'll go away, switch to it. Sure, yeah. Uh, but I, I made a pause. <laughs> uh, so, I'm sorry for asking it for a third time, um, but it's a different question. So, if, if I look back to this wonderful example of, uh, of how the chains uh, stuck uh, into a ray, uh, which is an example of a 2D spin one half. Uh, lettuce. Uh, yeah, uh, you are talking about this slide. Right. Okay. Yeah, no, no, we had the slide where they just were, were, yeah, this one, yeah. So this is the spins one half uh, sticking out of the 3D system. I may be genetic this question. Suppose I uh, shine a neutron or something and, and measure correlation function, dynamic correlation function of this spin one half um, on the surface. Right. Uh, can you tell uh, what would be interesting or maybe nothing interesting about such a measurable quantity? Uh, you mean like whether there's any measurable quantity about the bulk, about this fictitious bulk? Is that your question? Right, yes. So that would be wonderful, but even uh, you know, once in the time, wondering is that uh, it looks like uh, because kind of bulk is neutral, I'm not even sure that the spins on, on the surface somehow would have any interaction, any correlations between each other. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yes. <laughs> right. So it's, yeah, although I showed two surfaces here, top and bottom, they're not supposed to have any interactions with each other. Uh, so you, you, we, we want to imagine the bulk is large enough so that the top surface and bottom surface can be kind of completely decoupled and we can just look at one surface. Right, and then on one surface, are there any correlations between between spin between spins one half? Oh well, so uh, here I just kind of show the setup, right? Show kind of the system. Yes. So not you no know, uh, giving details about how the spins interact with each other, right? They are of course interacting by some antiferromagnetic interactions, for example, and that determines eventually you know, what you are going to observe on the surface, right? On this spin one half magnet. Um, so maybe a, a related questions like whether any of these things, you know, any of these anomaly, or any of these uh, signature can be detected, can be picked up by some dynamical correlation functions, for example, on the surface, on right. the uh, magnet. Um, well, so of course that depends on what you know, what state you have in mind about the spin one half magnet, and it's easy if you have symmetry breaking state, right? If you have you know, uh, nil order or you have valence bond, you can imagine measuring correlation functions, you know, uh, easily to pick up these symmetry breaking order. And the, the, probably the question is really, you know, what can you do to detect these uh, more exotic uh, states like a spin liquid? Um, I don't think I have a slide about this, but for example, in this case, in this case, these two sentences here, so the M anion move in the pi flux lattice and also the E anions carrying spin one half, uh, in fact, suggest ways to, uh, ways to measure them in some neutron scattering experiments. Okay. Uh, although you have to you know, uh, make a lot of assumptions about how to couple to the excitations, but they do leave some fingerprints in mm -hmm. dynamical correlation functions. Okay, okay, thanks. 
Okay, I see a uh, uh, hand raised from Yoram. Did you have a question? Yeah. Uh, yes, hi, hi Meng, that's a very nice talk. I have just a general question about experimental realization of these mm -hmm. symmetry protected topological phases. Right. I mean, are there examples that you can... Well, so there are lots of examples uh, to the mm -hmm. point of, well, so there are lots of examples of non-interacting uh, topological band insulators. No, there are probably mm -hmm. too many of them mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, yes. to some extent. Uh, and especially once you include spatial symmetries and they are, it just, it just seems like they're everywhere. Okay. And, but when it comes to the interacting, mm -hmm. yes. interacting ones, these are obviously much harder to find because mm -hmm. you know, they can only come by with strong interactions. Um, so you no, know, that is, a, <laughs> that is a, the open question like, you no, know, where do we all you know, how do we find these states in experiments, in materials. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, so there are some useful sort of hints like uh, you know, what interactions will favor these kind of decorated domain walls. Okay, the picture may suggest some ways to stabilize them. Okay, we have the complicated but, uh, the complicated but solvable Hamiltonians that realize uh, these states. So maybe you can deform them and still retain the same kind of uh, ground state. Or you can think more broadly like think about the kind of anomaly constraints that will force these states to be realized uh, in a certain system, as long as you don't break symmetries. Mm -hmm. So, and of course, in the end of the day, you have to put these uh, things into test, maybe like numerically. Right, so, yeah, but what kind of signature would you expect, I mean, to look for if, if you look at- Well, uh, so no, as I, yeah, so there, uh, the, the, there are basically two kinds of signature, right? One is, uh, how the system responds to probe gauge fields. Right. Gauge field. But that's, that, that's usually only when you have like a U1 symmetry or mm -hmm. no, some continuous symmetry. Otherwise it's very subtle. And so the more standard way to kind of uh, probe them is to look at what happens on the boundary. Okay. And that also depends on what exactly yes. you are looking at. Thank you. Okay, so thanks a lot. And um, I think that probably uh, I probably should form the the the, uh, the uh, physics club. But anyone who wants to remain and ask questions of Ming, I hope he's agreeable to that. Yeah, but, I'll, I'll be here a little longer. I'll I'll stop sharing the screen. So. Okay, but I did want to thank you again for a very nice talk, Ming. You know, thank, no problem. Thank, you. thank you. Did I stop? Yes, I think I stopped. Thank you, Ming. <laughs> okay, good to see you. So how long did it take you to prepare this? This was a pretty comprehensive talk. How long did it take you to prepare? Uh, I, I, I gave a, a similar version of this talk like a month ago, a different place, gotcha. uh, also on yeah. Zoom. But, so I had like something to I probably spend a couple of days back then. Uh, okay. So now I just need to like uh, modify a little bit. Gotcha. So it, it's not uh, too bad. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I did put some effort like, over the weekend. <laughs> yeah. Okay, very good. All right. Okay. Well. Okay, I guess no. Uh, yeah, I guess there are no questions. I don't hear. So. Yeah, so okay. Well, all right. Well, thanks again. And I, uh, I hope, hope to see you on campus again sometime. Right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Colleagues so much. I hope so. Okay. All right. I see Mike Zeller is still on. So Mike, are you, are you still there? I haven't, there's another colleague. In yeah, front. I'm here, but I, I, it was a really good talk, yeah. but I, I'm afraid I got in the middle of it. Oh, okay. <laughs> but I, but I thought it was really, it was, it was clear and I'm learning what you guys do for a living. <laughs> okay. Thanks. Michael. <laughs> yeah. And how are you doing, Mike? You doing well? Oh yeah, sure. Good. Okay. Except that I, I was 
unfortunately taking a nap, so I missed the beginning of this talk. Oh, okay. <laughs> but I point out, I didn't take a nap during the talk. Okay, all right. <laughs> yeah, I'm glad. <laughs> well, I hope to run into you again sometime, Mike. I haven't seen you in yeah. a Well, maybe this, maybe we'll get a vaccine and we yeah. can collect in Sloan. All right. All right. Well, at least see the light in the end of the tunnel. So. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Just to need to keep on for maybe another half a year or so. Yeah. Hope so. Yeah. They say they say that the 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 dark we have some dark days ahead of us though until the oh. day. That's what they say. But okay. Anyway, why did I put a damper on this? Okay. Then I guess right. I'll and um okay, okay I'm moving along up, but uh thanks again, man. And good to, good to talk with you, Mike. Good to talk to you. Okay. All right. Bye. Bye. Good.